Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the SIM Online Masterclass Series, Season 2. This is our first session, and the topic for today will focus on the machine learning. Just a few house rules before I introduce the speaker for today. So if you do have any questions along the way, whether it's during the masterclass or the program briefing, please feel free to type your questions out in the Q&A segment on the right-hand side of your browser. So whether you are on the open house platform or the uh, masterclass platform, on your right-hand side, there is uh, type your question here, ask your questions here, tab. So you can just type your question there and we will pick it up and answer. Dr. Jamie Watt and our UOL staff will assist to answer these questions. And uh, if there's any other questions that are not being answered during this session, you can always reach out to our e-booth. So we do have uh, program booths that's uh, conducted by our, hosted by our UOL staff. So you can go to the booth there and speak to our staff via live chat or video conferencing to have your questions answered. So I will go into the speaker for today. So Dr. Jamie Watt, he is the lecturer, lecturer in machine learning at Goldsmith, University of London. He is also a visiting researcher and guest professor at University College London and Keio University in Japan. He has many ongoing collaborations with the researchers at the German Center of Artificial Intelligence, Kessler Slaughter. His key focus are methods of recognizing and understanding human activity and social interaction. Interdisciplinary by nature, his work draws on the country draws on and contributes to the topic within the broader fields of variable computing and social neuroscience. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jamie Watt. Dr. Watt, hand over to you. Thank you very much, June. And thank you all for coming to see this talk. Um, my apologies if I'm a little bit draggled this morning. It's very early in the morning over here in, in Britain. Um, but I'm looking forward to um, hopefully meeting some of you online at some point if you um, come and do the course. So this talk is a little overview of some of the material that's in the machine learning course. It's just a little taster of it, um, some of it in more detail than others. I called it machine learning from the lab to the real world, because for me, machine learning is a tool. It's something that we use to be able to do things. Um, and in my particular case, my particular research, well, I'll say a little bit about that as an introduction, just to get an idea of where I come from. Because I think with this sort of course, um, lots of us come from very different backgrounds with lots of different intentions or ideas of how to use the technology. So many years ago, I started working in the health sector and the idea was, could you build um, a wearable that can you know, save your life? So if someone has a heart problem, and we look at the physiological signals, the heart rate and the, um, the ECG, electrocardiogram, you can detect whether someone's going to have some kind of heart problem, a heart attack, a day or several days before the actual event. You can see degradations in the signal and changes in the signals. Now, this is something that like, you know, health professionals have known about for years. But the problem is, Traditionally, to monitor the heart, you have to be in a hospital with electrodes attached to you and lots of sensors. So the goal of this project that we worked on a few years ago was, can we put all of these sensors inside a wristwatch and allow people to go home and wander around and, you know, hopefully we can pick out some issues before they start to happen. The project was called AIMON and um, we built it as a prototype and one of the things we found about it was, yes, you can measure these signals, but as people move around, um, the signals are noisy. There's a lot of movement artifacts, so you don't know if you can trust those signals. But actually, more crucially, the characteristic heart signals themselves, your heart rate, it changes in different situations. So if you go for a run, it's different. If you're having an argument with someone, it's different. If you have a cup of coffee, it's different too. So all of these different factors in your life play into these well-known physiological signals. And that meant that if I was to build a device that actually was useful in this way, we would have to also interpret these other um, con these bits of contextual information. The device would have to understand what activities we were doing in quite a bit of detail 
so that we could then interpret the changes to the heart signals. So this motivated a field called activity recognition, which I worked on for many years. And this is a sort of, this uses machine learning. It's, we're, using, we're collecting data from sensors and processing that to interpret some kind of meaning. One of the projects I worked on um, that followed this was in a very different scenario. It was an industrial scenario. And the problem is that um, say you're fixing um, a safety critical infrastructure. So, so you've got an engineer fixing an aircraft engine and they have to be very specific about which bits of the air, aircraft engine they take out and which bits they put in again. If they forget anything, they could have a problem. The idea was, could we build a wearable that tracks whenever you take a nut or a bolt or you use a particular tool could, that could detect those and track them? So that for safety reasons. Now we couldn't get access to an aircraft engine. So we just went a lot simpler and built a woodwork studio where you're building things out of wood. And the two wearable sensors that we looked at were movement, so accelerometer, which measures the, the change, changes in force um, in different axes. So we looked at like you know moving up and down and left and right. Uh, I say that just following, following my thumb and following my finger. And you can imagine if you've got a sensor on your wrist and you're using a saw, there'd be a very characteristic movement sound. But lots of things could make that same, sorry, movement sound, movement signals early in the morning. But lots of things could make that same signal. So what is it that we could do that could help make it less ambiguous? Well, if we recorded sound as well, the audio, the microphones, you would have a characteristic sawing sound. So there would be both a movement and a sound. And by combining two very different modalities, audio and movement, we had a much higher recognition rate of being able to detect the use of the various tools. Now, again, this is drawing in data from relatively simple sensors and combining them. And these different kinds of sensors, we could call the, the, the data from them, we call these features, different features, different ways of looking at the world. And then can we develop an algorithm that can automatically detect what's going on? Moving more into sort of human level things, I was interested in, can we then start to sense what's going on in your head? Now, it's hard to sense the brain and we'll get to that in a second. But one thing we can look at is the most visible part of the brain and that's your eye. The eyes are quite unique. They both give and receive information. They allow you to, your window in the world, you get to see what's going on out there. But equally, as you're looking, you signal to others what you're looking at. They're a signaling mechanism. They send out different signals. And if we know what your eyes are doing, we get an idea of what, sometimes what you're thinking. So as an idea for um, a study, we thought, could we track someone's eye and detect when they were doing certain activities, such as reading? Now, when a person's reading, uh, their eyes make characteristic sig signals as they scan from letter to letter, word to word. It depends on which kind of script, obviously, for different, um, um, different kinds of text from around the world. But you, your eyes will make saccades. And the question is, could we detect these using a sensor, a sensor and then detect it using machine learning and, and classify it to be able to detect the person's reading? Now, the method used here, and I won't go into it in too much detail, but it was an electrical method. So it was looking at electro-oculography. So your eye is like a battery. It's like a, a charge, a, um, a cell. And as it moves, the potential difference, if I put electrodes either side of my eye, the potential difference, the voltage changes that I measure as I move my eye, both in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction. So if we put electrodes here, we could measure up and down, here, left and right. And that's what we did. We put electrodes all over a bunch of people. We gave them a copy of an uh, original Harry Potter. This was a few years ago. And we got them to um, just read it and then not read it. And we recorded all the signals, as you can see here, these are the signals from the horizontal and the vertical. Now, crucially, we wanted to see, could you detect these things as people were moving around, as they were going for a run or a walk? So we got people doing these things, doing physical things. And the signals are really noisy, really 
messy, not trustworthy. You, you wouldn't be sure whether you could detect breathing or not when people were moving. But if we include movement data, so acceleration data from little sensors we also had in a cap, then we could really cut out the data, cut out the noisy data and choose nice smooth parts. Now this sort of algorithm, this sort of combining different sensors, removing noise from the data, so cleaning your data, and then processing the data to try and automatically recognize things. These are all part of the, the typical machine learning uh, recognition um, uh, pipeline, if you like. It's a, it's, a it's a fairly standard way of doing things now. Um, and yes, my activity is, could you, my, my whole work has been about, can you sense things in the real world um, to achieve certain aims? Um, I'll move on from these sensors. So yes, and the, the, that work that we did, it, it has some commercial applications. Um, if you're able to sense a person's uh, eyes and head movement, you can actually reveal a lot of useful information. And we could look at sort of things like cognitive load. Are you concentrating? Um, and a company, Jin's in, in, um, in Japan, has launched a pair of spectacles, which have all these sensors in it based on some of our work. Um, and this has got, you know, this then sends this data to your phone, which then can run some machine learning on it to do sort of lots of interesting things on that. My work then moved towards actually more the social interaction side of things. It's all very well studying, sensing from one person what's happening to me. But what about others? When I interact with others, interesting things happen. So we've started looking at different ways of how, when two people have a conversation, how their little things like their head movement or their eye movement, how that changes. And can we record this using wearable devices and then use the data to uncover something interesting? Um, I've got work on that. You can have a look at if you're interested in it. And it leads to what I'm currently mostly focused on is um, using theatre is a space. So that one of the main things about machine learning is that it's based on data, the data in the world that you want to record. So the more data you have, you can, you can build better algorithms. But obtaining realistic data from certain situations can be difficult. Um, if you imagine you want to get some data on, can you rec the heart attack monitor, for example, do you want to detect when people are having an argument? Well, to recognize that you need to record lots of arguments and that cannot always be easy to do and um, privacy reasons and so forth but theater if you like is a laboratory of human social interaction it's thousands of years old it's where we put the real world we put it on stage we take out the boring bits make it fun and interesting but at the same time it tries to depict things that happen that are unique to the human condition depict them on stage in a repeatable way. The theatre performance is every night, so it's repeated again and again and again with subtle differences. This repetition and this uh, fixed environment is actually perfect for scientists to be able to look at social interactions and study them in more detail. And, and as an, a machine learning and sensing person, a wearable computing person, I can put wearable sensors on these actors and monitor and record data from all this. So it's a valuable data set we get to work with. And one of the things that um, where that can actually be useful is we were able to study not just the performers on stage, but also the audience. How are the audience responding? Right now, for example, I'm giving a talk to uh, 42 people. I don't see any of you. It's, it's quite scary. I don't know if you're listening or what's going on. I don't have any feedback. But in live theater, you've got an audience and you can, there's a sort of feedback coming on. So we've been, we've been monitoring and trying to record this sort of data using wearable sensors, using little head nods, and we're beginning to look at eye tracking as well. Um, and you can uncover lots of very social, interesting social things. Uh, and that's particularly useful when we have case, when we want to study where those social connections break down. Um, in certain conditions. So for example, um, autism. In autism, it's a, it's a, people have difficulty with social interactions and difficulty with communication. And we think that a lot of this is related to the nonverbal 
communications, the head nods and so on. And this is something we can start to study and analyze more. Now, all of that research is, capable, is possible because of advances in machine learning, been able to process lots of data coming in. So the topic of the course, that was a lot about me actually. So I'm going to move on now, talk about this, this specifically about the course. So what is machine learning? People try to um, categorize it in different ways. And I, I'm just going to use these sort of big Venn diagrams. We've got computer science, which is a study of algorithms and, and you know, computational methods of doing things. Then you've got statistics, which is about numbers and you know, getting lots of, lots of data in and try to calculate significances and so on. And they sort of overlap. And it's in this bit where the overlap, we also have a, a, a more, in the last 50 years, artificial intelligence, AI, where we're trying to, well, there's lots of questions with artificial intelligence, but you could have general AI, we want to build the, the how, we want to build the, 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 the supreme intelligence that can answer everything that is better than us. Or we can have specific artificial intelligence, which has been perhaps the most, well, has been the most successful version of it, where it's like we take a very narrow problem and we try to solve that in a, an intelligent way and have a machine that can be very intelligent for a very specific task, driverless cars or your, um, your Alexa or your, your, your chatbot. Um, the stuff I've been doing in activity recognition, recognizing um, sewing, for example, in a wood workshop, and then maybe doing something with that. That would be very specific AI. Now, again, at the crux of all of these things is data science. And it's um, this is where we're interested with actually the topic of this of this course, the wider part of this course, where you we want to find ways of interpreting data. And it's largely statistics. What does it trying to understand the world? but using AI and methods from computer science to help us to do that. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, machine learning sits right in there. It's the specific set of tools that we can learn to, we can use to learn from data. And that's basically generally as specific as I'm going to get with this. Machine learning is just using data to learn algorithms, to learn things from data. Let's look at it in a little bit more, a little bit more detail. We start off with data. What is data? Experience. It's, it's a bunch of images, it's pictures, it's videos, it's censored data, it's things you've typed in. It's information about the world. And we feed that into our computer, our algorithms. The computer should learn something about them, learn something of the nature of them. Try and generalize based on that data. And then the idea is, well, within the computer is then used for a specific task, um, recognizing something. So recognize a goat, a type of animal, or recognizing, is that a pedestrian on the road? Or recognizing, is it a saw or a hammer? So a recognition task. That's one type of um, machine learning task. There are many others. <clears throat> and then, if we know how well it's done, that's how we, um, that's what we want to do next. We want to figure out its performance. So if we've got um, goat recognition, I'll come to the goats in a minute, but you've got a picture of something and you want to say, right, what is that picture? Um, if it's a goat and you know it's a goat and the machine says it's a goat, then tick, correct, you got it right. Or if it's a tractor and the machine said it's a goat, you got it wrong. So each time it gets it, the, the algorithm will get it right or wrong. We judge its performance and we use that information to optimize learning. So that's the whole process of, of machine learning. So let's have a little look at it in a sort of, um, I won't get too mathematical here, but let's try and put a little sort of functional, a, li a little bit of mathematical language in here just to get a flavor of it. So here's a challenge. You want, you've been asked um, to build a function and it has two inputs. It's got X, X and Z, and those are images. And then the output is a new image. 
And the new image should be the average of, of the two of them. So we want to sort of combine two images into one simple function we want to build. It could look something like this. So these are pixels. These, um, each one here is a pixel, and it's either black or white here. And this is our image one, and this is, this is our image X, and this is our image Z. And we want to create this, the average. So if we average white and black, we get gray. White and black, we get gray. Black and white, we get gray. So it's a very, yeah, hopefully that makes sense what's going on there, pixel by pixel. Now, this is something we can do with a computer very easily. We can code that in with a little bit of code. Now, regardless of whether you've had much programming experience or not, a few lines of, um, I think in this case, Python, um, well, it's not, it's, it's pseudocode, I apologize. We create a little function which goes from each pixel up the pixel from X with the pixel from Y and then divide by two. So if white is the number zero, black is the number one, we add zero plus one, divide by two, we get 0 0.5, which gives us the grayscale. So that's a deterministic function. We don't need machine learning for that. It's not machine learning, it's classical, just write an algorithm. Here's a similar problem. I want a function and I'm only going to give it one input, x, which is an image. And I want the function to output a zero or a one. So it returns one if the image is of a goat. It's my goats again. And it returns zero if it's not a goat. So this is a recognition task. So what I want is I put a picture of a goat in here. It should output one. If I put a picture of a xylophone, not a goat, it should output zero. How would you build a function that does that? Can you code one using a bit of Python code? Can you code one using, um, you know, in a deterministic way? You could say, well, if this pixel is a little bit brown, then this one's a little bit white, and then this one's a little bit brown, and then this one here is a bit yellow, then it's a goat. That would work, possibly. It would be convoluted and horrible code. It would work for this one picture. But what if you start giving it another picture? of a different goat. They're all goats, but they look different. Your algorithm is not going to work. You have to think of something new. And this is where machine learning comes into play. Machine learning learns from data. So instead of trying to say specifically what the algorithm will do, we just feed it a bunch of pictures. We feed a generic machine learning algorithm with a bunch of pictures, and it learns from the data to try and uncover some characteristic of what a goat is. Now, the essence, therefore, of our machine learning algorithms and the success of them is this data that we're feeding in. And the data comes from the real world, usually, pictures, images, and so on. But there are problems with that. If the data is messy or noisy, it's the algorithms might not work so work well. There's a lot of variations in data. So you could take a very similar image, <clears throat> but there would be differences in illumination, for example. Um, the lighting conditions really changes the data quite a lot. You could have uncontrolled settings. You don't know whether someone's going to be wearing a mask, <laughs> particularly these days, um, whether there is a curtain in the way, the background is different. There's occlusions, yeah. Someone could be wearing a mask or a pair of sunglasses and their image changes. So your machine learning algorithms have to cope with this real world data. This also, you know, deliberately weird data you got here. You know, these are all ostensibly giraffes that have been messed up. And the thing is, the real world is noisy. The real world is messy. And we have to design our algorithms to cope with that. So we touch on some of this within the course. Now, what kind of applications are we interested in here? There's so many, you'll know more than me because it's just like every day there's a new machine learning algorithm out there. One of the um, popular early uh, applications that many of us have on our phones is face detection. And this is simply, can I detect, can the machine learning algorithm detect 
where your face is um, in a picture uh, or in a video and you know that's running on our phones once you've detected where the face is and this is not detecting who the person is it's just saying right i'll put a box around where their face is you can start to make little changes and swaps so face detection is a very popular app uh, use of machine learning but the next thing is it's one thing to detect where a face is but the next is to detect whose face that is that's the recognition part of face tracking and usually for that you collect an awful lot of data and we provide it free of charge by having facebook and social media where we plaster our face everywhere and crucially each time we plaster our face, it has our name beside it. So that provides labeling and that allows the machine learning algorithms very, very easily to detect who we are. Uh, again, we're all probably very familiar with this in our phones and also uh, passports um, control increasingly. Um, and these things are getting better. The first, whenever I passed at an airport through one of the automatic passport machines, I'd sometimes have my glasses, sometimes wouldn't. And it used to be I'd go in without my glasses and it would never work. And then I'd have to take my glasses off and then it would give me an instruction and I wouldn't be able to see. So I'd go in closer and it says stand back and I can't see. So I put them on and then it just, it was always horrible. The last time I went through it, it just beeped and let me through really quickly. The system is learning for better or worse. And indeed, um, it won't be a surprise of you to know how much tracking is going on and how that may be being used for ill. Um, by governments as well, uh, in particular. Um, but whenever there's a technology like this, there's also ways of subverting it, as many of the people in, in Hong Kong have shown, where you can put interesting face paints on your, on your face, and that would change how the recognition algorithm works, i.e. it can break it. Um, and we talk a little bit about that as well. Now, moving on from face tracking, Another application is body tracking. And this is, um, again, another useful in machine learning algorithm where you're able to sort of, my earlier work, like I said, was using sensors on the body, but we could, if we have a video camera, you could avoid that and just detect where people's limbs are. And there's open, pose, um, open source projects like Open Pose and Open Face, um, Open Pose in particular, can pick out um, components from people's bodies and faces from multiple people in the same shop. Now, this is a really hard problem to solve, and it's taken years to get there, but it's over almost overnight. Some nice machine learning algorithms have allowed this to be um, relatively straightforward. And I've, I've used this some of my research. So as I say, some of my research has been involved with social interactions and how people respond when they, they interact with each other, when they have conversations. Um, and one of the things we do is we put people into motion capture labs this is where you've got like you know cameras all around you and infrared cameras and actually de in a detailed way reconstruct the um, your skeleton and your, your body as you're interacting but one of the to use is use open face to sort of automatically do people's faces are so these people are wearing motion capture suits they've also got eye trackers that's why you can see their eyes and um, but we can use open face on top of the video we've collected to be able to um get a lot more detail on what's going on in people's faces and so on. This also allows us to detect when you've looked at someone's eye. So combining all these different machine learning tools has, has made a lot of um, interesting research a lot easier. Now, perhaps the most popular uh, AI application that's been talked about a lot at the moment is driverless cars. <clears throat> um, it's obviously very useful um, for many people. Um, I live where there aren't many cars, so <laughs> it's not useful for me. Um, but I think if you're, you know, um, I think it, this, this is this, there's another thing behind this. So driverless cars are obviously very um, in the media and in the news, and they do. There will be problems. It's absolutely clear on that. But it's quite amazing that using machine learning um, algorithms, they're able to detect pedestrians and detect parts of the road, even under different conditions, and able to uh, do a fantastic amount of um, artificial intelligence in real time as a car is driving. It really is quite impressive. 
Um, but there are problems with that, and uh, I'll come to that later. And one of the key things that has to be able to do if you've got a car driving around is to be able to detect pedestrians and people jumping out onto the streets. Um, this is actually part of, I think it's still a challenge, Google AI Open Images Challenge, to try and get, um, we've given a bunch of videos and images, and there's a competition. So a lot of machine learning work is driven by competitions. You pit lots of researchers, lots of people against one another to try and see who can and train their algorithm the best, come up with the best machine learning algorithms um, to do things like this, take pedestrians. Another application area is recommender systems. This is something you're all familiar with if you've ever used Netflix or Amazon, and who hasn't these days? If you bought this, then you would like this. Now behind the scenes, that's a machine learning algorithm. It's one that is uh, clustering your behaviors, um, or maybe clustering, your behaviors and your previous things and can it, comparing you to um, other people who have done similar things and then suggesting something. Now this can also lead to some problems, but again, that is a topic to be discussed further. And natural language processing, one of the most successful uses of AI and machine learning algorithms. It's it's being used all over. It's being used right now um, as I speak. It's where we are having Alexa or Google AI listening in on us, listening for certain keywords and doing something. And this is remarkable how quickly this has become um, so prevalent. And, and also for, I have a, I'm Scottish, I have a different accent from sort of your typical um, uh, British person. And for many years, voice recognition never worked for me, never at all. It was always a nightmare, it never understood me. But now it does. And that's quite something to, for these devices to be able to deal with such variations, such differences in people's voices and accents is quite impressive. And that's all thanks to machine learning. So a lot of that stuff I've been talking about is recognizing, recognition stuff, recognizing things in the world. But then there's the case where we're going to generate, we're using machine learning to generate new things. So generative machine learning is where we get a computer to try and create something. So here's a bunch of handwriting samples. Can you say which one of these is real? Because only one is real. The rest has been generated by an AI bot and generated by machine learning algorithm. For future reference, this is the one Alex Graves did this research back well, many years ago now. This has all since moved on. But, um, you know, this is the real one. Here's what the computer's generated. Very realistic. More scarily, this can be applied to faces. How many people here are real? Of all these very, very, you know, these human beings. Well, none of them are real. These are all completely automated, completely um, artificially generated human faces um, using a, a version of adversarial neural networks to um, generative adversarial neural networks to generate them. Generative adversarial neural networks, a very powerful class of machine learning algorithms. Um, it can also be used um, for things like this. So we've got this translation network. So this is where a piece of video has been taken. I think the original is the snowy one here without much colouring and by training up an algorithm and um, showing it what trees look like in different situations like the same tree in winter and summer and then you know different colorations and so on and then feeding it in this piece of video it churns out this it's changed the season completely it's added colour all automatically it's very very powerful um, algorithm, set of algorithms. Now these, these raise some major challenges that we have to deal with. I tried to cover these in the course. So the course will cover um, the algorithms, how to use them, the most important algorithms that has the basics and you know where it can go and what we can do with them. But I also try to touch on um, the ethical issues of it. The, these famous deep fakes were created using machine learning algorithms. You could have Obama or someone else giving a speech, saying words that the human, the real person never actually said. And this leads to questions of trust. Can we trust what we see? Can we trust what we hear? 
And we have to find some way of finding trust. So these are challenges also for machine learning, both in should we be using machine learning for things like this? And if we do, and if others do, how can we then use machine learning to instill trust to sort of say, no, this is a fake or this is not to do fake detection, for example. Ethical questions, there are so many of them, particularly with something like driverless cars. Yes, your driverless car may work under more circumstances, but if one in a thousand cases, one in a million cases, it fails, that's someone's life. There are lots of ethical issues with this. So the whole driverless car thing has really been pushed by um, car obsessed people in California, if I, if I come to, to put it blunt, bluntly. And, you know, big wide roads, um, you know, not usually that many pedestrians crossing the road on some of these big highways. So it, it makes sense for them. But there are problems. So there's a, there's a, um, a philosophical problem called the trolley problem that many of you may have heard of. And it's an ethical dilemma where, you know, do you're driving along or you're You've got a train going somewhere. There's lots of different versions of it, but you've got you've got a there's a trolley, and there's a, a break in the junction. So the trolley's going along its track, and if it keeps on going, there are five people tied to the track. It's going to hit five people and kill five people. But you have the choice to flip the switch and divert the trolley, and then it will kill only one person. And there's variations on this where perhaps it's an older person or or so on, or it's a child. Do you kill the five or the one? Now, these kind of philosophical and ethical questions, they are flawed in their question, but that's another issue altogether. But they, they, there is no easy answer to that. And people have debated this for many, many years. But a bunch of computer scientists, a bunch of machine learning experts in California just said, oh, we've solved it. We've solved this decades old problem, this thousands of years old problem. Yeah, we've just coded it. And it goes into their algorithm. Um, with relatively little debate. And I think that is a problem. So as, as machine learning specialists, we need to look at the ethics early on and think about them and figure out how we can influence or not. I prattle on. Um, one of the other things is this idea of reliability. And this is where it was very interesting, more so than the stop sign, but it was very interesting with the Hong Kong protests, where in um, the, 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 perhaps the most prominent machine learning algorithm that, that gets in the news and is used for driverless cars and so on is deep learning. Now, deep learning is often oversold. It doesn't do everything and it has lots of problems with it. One of them is we don't actually always understand what a particular deep learning algorithm is actually doing. It's learned based on data, but we don't know what exactly it has learned. And a classic example is um, that this, these, these researchers did. They had a machine learning algorithm that could detect stop signs. And so these are an example of stop signs. And they found that if they put little bits of tape, little black and white bits of tape over certain parts of the stop sign, so that you as a human, you still think it's a stop sign, the machine suddenly thought the sign said something else. It said, go left. And that sort of problem means we're not sure we can really rely on some of these things. So a little bit of tape, a little bit of paint, and suddenly an algorithm that worked very well completely fails, and we're not quite sure why. More fundamentally, the biggest problem with learning from data and getting that data from the real world is that the real world is filled with biases it's filled with prejudices and problems in itself. The real, the data is not neutral. Therefore, the technology that is built on it is not neutral. Classic example, Microsoft launched Taybot. It was a Twitter AI bot for teenage girls. And this Twitter bot was going to just discuss fun things that would be fun for teenage girls. That was the idea. It would learn from um, interactions that people had with it. Of course, within a few hours, the internet plowed in with all the sort of racist, misogynist, sexist, all of the bad stuff, all piled in there. And um, within a few hours, this table was, was saying Nazi slogans and making racist and prejudiced statements. Of course, Microsoft had to bring it down and said, oh, we'll go and fix it. They tried to fix it, launched it again, 
And again, it, I think it lasted like two or three hours before the robot went AWOL again and started just um, coming out with all sorts of horrible things. Now, this was focused. This was obviously a bunch of people were in to really you know, upset the thing and, um, and deliberately damage it. But these biases exist. I mean, if we were to take the internet as a snapshot of the world, the world would look like a fairly horrible place. There is a disproportionate amount of um, uh, negative things that end up online. Um, and that affects your data. You, if you're going to train an algorithm that reflects the real world, you're going to have to find some way of cleaning that data and, and removing the bias from it. <clears throat> now, there's also unintended bias. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is where we need to think of smart ways around this, in a way. Um, <clears throat> here's an, uh, a classic example using Google Translate. You can still do this. This is still a problem. We write in, say, in English in Google Translate, she's a professor. He's a babysitter. And we translate it to Turkish. Now, Turkish is a non-gender language. <clears throat> the um, professor, babysitter, doesn't have um, a gender. So, so it translates it correctly to Turkish. And this is translation. Now, take the Turkish and put it into the translate to translate it back to English. The algorithm has a problem. There is no genders here. There's no gendered information. So, but for English, there is. We need a he or a she. So what does it do? Well, it consults the internet and it looks and sees, all oh, right, most professors are male. So that's a he. Most babysitters are she. So we put she there. Not even that most professors are male, most babysitters are she male or female. It's that um, most, it's a typo, it's that most the of the um, instances where those words professor and babysitter are used are connected to a he or a she. So it's using this unintended bias to um, you know, create a problem. And um, as I yeah, I'm approaching the end here, um, there's lots of instances where uh, AI using machine learning algorithms has uh, gone off what it was intended to do. So you try to, um, there was, there's a bunch, there's some lovely examples in a big spreadsheet here by Victoria Krakow, which um, it, it describes systems which people built um, and they didn't, yeah, the, the, the goals of the machine learning algorithm weren't specified adequately. So there was a roadrunner game where the AI was trying to play the game and it discovered that if it kills itself at the end of level one, it won't lose level two. Because the goal was, you know, can you can you win at level? Uh, don't lose at level two. Um, uh, more seriously, there was a a, a cancer detection um, algorithm that was built, a machine learning one, and it was trained up using images of cancerous lesions, and um, it was cancerous lesions and non-cancerous lesions were fed into the algorithm so it could learn and it, you know, detect cancer with like ninety nine point nine 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 percent very high accuracy. Unfortunately, it wasn't, it was a deep learning method. It wasn't actually learning based on the cancer. It was learning based on the fact that whenever there was actually a cancerous sample, someone had left a ruler beside it. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that it was actually detecting, was detecting the ruler. Um, finally, this is a thing that is starting to be talked about more, and I think it needs to be talked about a lot more, is the environmental impact of AI and machine learning. Now, it's one thing I was sitting on our computers and, oh, let's try a little machine learning algorithm on this. I'll run a, a deep learning algorithm on this. I'll try and do some natural language processing, and it will be done on Google's server. Well, oops, apologies. I thought I had a table on that. This actually uses more energy than we often expect. So to train some of the better um, natural language processing, speech recognition, so on, um, and speech generation, to, to, to train some of those algorithms has been shown to use um, as much energy as, as running a, a diesel car for five years, um, or, or, or I believe a transatlantic flight with no people in it. And that's quite significant. And we need to think about that as it becomes cumulatively and more people using these algorithms. 
And can we find ways of doing it in a cheaper way? Sometimes you don't need to use the most expensive machine learning algorithm. You can use something much simpler. And that's something I tried to focus in on the course. So the course itself, um, there are 10 topics that we cover. Introduction, uh, which covers a lot of what I've said here, but, but a little bit more. Uh, then we look at classification tasks. Can we recognize specific things? It's a supervised machine learning. Um, linear regression, so simple, basic machine learning algorithms. So giving you the grounding on these things. Uh, model improvements, so the optimization step. How do your machines actually learn? And then we look at unsupervised learning. That's like recommender systems, clustering, where we don't know about the data beforehand. We don't have any labels on it. Ensemble methods, a very powerful class of machine learning methods where it's, um, you know, lots and lots of little machine learning algorithms all pulling together. So it's like a voting system. Um, we'll cover neural networks and deep learning. I don't focus on that throughout the course too much because I think that's just something that has been overplayed a lot, but we I talk about that here in topic seven. Then we look at specific cases of, let's say, working with time series. It's a particular type of um, machine learning, which is very useful. And I finish up on probabilistic modeling. So it's dealing with uncertainty and then talking about ethics and sustainability. Right, I have talked for too long, please. Um, this is, uh, that, that is the end of my talk, this section of it. So um, yes, I would like to pass on to. Yes, you. thank you, Dr. Jamie Watt for that really interesting talk and very insightful. Uh, today, joining us online, we've got two groups of students, potential master students and potential undergrad students. Uh, Shenghui, my colleague, uh, you do have some questions from the undergrads? Yes, oh, we do have a question for Dr. Jamie Ward. Hi, yes. Um, the question is, are there instances, scenarios when machine learning should not be used? Absolutely, lots of instances. I mean, I think there's cases where we got to look at, um, you look at the ethical implications of something. Is it going to be a big environmental um, impact of using a machine learning algorithm? Or, and or, can I do it using traditional algorithms? There's no point in using machine learning if I can just write a little bit of code that does it in a for loop. You know, so you, you've got to judge that. And I think as doing a course like this, it, aler it allows you to be able to learn to judge when and when not to use machine learning. Right. Um, Shenghui, any questions on your end? Otherwise, I've got two questions here. Over to you, Denise. Okay, right. Just let me... Okay. Right, the question here is about... Um, is there any relationship between machine learning and blockchain? And the same person also asked, is quantum computing related to data science? Oh, nice questions. These are all good questions. Um, so blockchain is a, is a set of tools, but largely blockchain is a, is a ledger. It's a, it's a way of storing information. It's kind of like, a, but, but storing it in a way that's immutable, in a way that it can't be changed. And, it's a, it's a system of, of storing data. It can use machine learning in as, as, as a tool to analyze the blockchain or do things with the blockchain, but it's not, it is not, I would not classify blockchain as, as machine learning. It's, um, uh, machine learning is learning from data. Blockchain is a way of storing data. It's a much more, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of machine learning uses with blockchain, but immediately off the top of my head, no, um, I else can chip in on that, but. It's not the same. Okay, right. So, um, thank you. And uh, what I'll do now is that I'd like to share because there have been questions about the program itself. So, Sorry, what I'll Denise, do I now. Sorry, there was a second question there, wasn't there? If I didn't answer that one. What was the second question? <laughs> you, uh, you gave is quantum there? computing? Quantum. Is quantum con computing data science? Yeah, right. So, quantum computing, no. I, well, I'm sure someone might find a way of using it. Quantum computing is, is um, it, it, largely experimental at the moment, but it's a way of being able to um, make use of quantum dynamics to be able to um, store data and make decisions on things. And I would say data science is, if quantum computing is down here, you've got physics and electronics, you've got quantum computing, 
it's really the starting level of things. Data science is way up here. It's much more high level. It's sort of like you and I can use it, but you and I can't really do quantum computing right yet. It's not, not quite at that stage. Okay, right. There are more questions. And um, actually, one, uh, there's one about if I do not have any computing background, uh, can I still take the program? So, um, yes, Dr. Jamie, what? Python? Minimum yeah, Python? So it's for this particular course, we're finding it's very helpful if people have done a little bit of Python before. Um, I introduced Python, I tried it, so if you're quick with it, you can maybe pick it up. I, I have all the material on it, but we have an introductory course on Python, which goes with this, and I highly recommend doing that, just so that you're a bit more familiar with programming, because as part of the course, we do a little bit of things. We, we, do, we do some loops and some code that it would be very helpful to be a bit more um, just used to programming a little bit. You don't have to be an expert, but to have done a bit of it before. So I we, we highly recommend doing the introduction to Python course that goes along with this. Right, thank you. So um, for the gentleman that asked the question, actually in my upcoming slides, I will show you uh, the admissions criteria. So perhaps let me share screen, uh, Dr. Jamie Watt, and then I will go through some of the pointers for the Masters of Science program. Right, so I'm Denise Mock, the Senior Manager for the University of London programs at SIM. And over at SIM, uh, you know, we've been around for 56 years. Our partnership with University of London is close to 35 years. So next year, we celebrate our 35th anniversary. Now, we've University of London, we partner three very, um, you know, reputable colleges. They are LSE, UCL, and Goldsmiths. For Goldsmiths, um, partnership is about 27 years, and we've been running the Computing and Information Systems program for more than two decades. So this year, we see a new launch of programs, and that's the MSc in Data Science, and BSc in Computer Science. So I'll talk more about the MSc in uh, Data Science uh, later today. Um, we also want to say that, you know, when you study at SIM, we put in a lot of resources. We make sure that we give you the best resources. For example, we try to get the best lecturers. And if there are challenges in students' learning, there'll be additional workshops and consultations for students. Now, talking about the Data Science program, this is rather flexible, it's stackable, right? So you can start with a post-grad cert and then post-grad bit and finally master's. But we do have students who already know that they want to complete the master's and they sign up directly for the master's. The good thing about this data science program is that there are specializations available, artificial intelligence and financial technology. So, Let's talk about the MSc in Data Science. For the master's program, you have to take six core and compulsory modules. So such as um, modules such as maths and stats for data science, machine learning, data programming in Python, big data analysis. Then there's also data science research topics, data visualization. And then you get to choose four modules of your choice. Okay, you could see that there are uh, a list of modules there for you to choose. And at the end of the semester, you need to complete a project. For the specializations in FinTech, students have seven core and compulsory modules and three optionals. And then project is necessary. Similarly, for artificial intelligence, MSc in, uh, with specialization in AI, again, you have to complete seven modules and you have got optionals as well, three optional modules. Now, why study data science? Um, Jamie, some, any recommendations or any suggestions? Why should students sign up for data science? I mean, the world is driven by data now. Uh, it's just the way things are going. Everything, every, every industry, every possible thing of, that humans do is 
is it has data science as a part of it. It's it, or data is used as part of it. The more data we collect and make decisions about the world, um, and data scientists are the people that are able to use this. So the people that are able to choose which tools are appropriate for which tasks. And this is just a very, I, I think it's something also that, that largely should be maybe taught more in schools and brought right down. So I think it's something we should all be learning about. So I would highly recommend getting a knowledge and understanding of data science and the tools involved across the population. So yeah, start soon. <laughs> okay. And um, what about any comments on the Goldsmiths MSc in data science? You know, what are the strengths of this program? So the thing with this is, and, and one of your questions before was, was, was very good about the, um, the technical requirements we've been able to program before. The nice thing about this is you, you can get in there and learn the basics of, you know, learn the maths that you need, learn the programming that you need to be able to do it, and learn the algorithms and, and get yourself up to a point where you've, you've, you've learned all these basics without necessarily having to have done a computer science degree for three years beforehand. So this is the advantage of it. We try to get everyone up into a, into a level where they're able to do things usefully um, using all of the various skills required without needing too much beforehand. I think that's the key thing about this. Great. Right. Um, you could see on screen now, this is a, a, a group of students. They joined the April intake, right? We have uh, more than a dozen of them and they were from different industries. So we had a Zoom orientation with them. Um, we could see that they come from biotech, they come from e-commerce areas, education, IT, research or telecom. So it's wide ranging. Now, let's talk about program delivery at SIM. So right now it's the pandemic season. Our classes will be online. Uh, in time to come when we are allowed to come back, you know, there would be face-to-face -face seminars. There are um, self-study resources for students from the University of London VLE, Virtual Learning Environment. Then we also have workshops and then consultations for students. Consultations because for the program, for the master's program, there are coursework and our tutors will support the students, uh, you know, helping them through the, the uh, coursework. For each semester, which is a six month, uh, you know, each semester is about six months, 22 weeks, we will run three modules every semester. In a while, I'll show you how the timetable looks like. So basically, classes are conducted 10 lessons over 22 weeks. So it's like almost alternate weeks, you have this particular module. And uh, the classes could be in the evenings or on Saturdays. Exams are in mid-March or mid-September. Right, earlier I mentioned about uh, study resources. So VLE, Virtual Learning Environment, would have online textbooks for you. There will be quizzes, videos as well. Um, you know, at the same time, you will have access to the UOL online library. Software, I've just named one, Jupyter Notebook. There'll be any, uh, other software for you as well, free for you for this program. Now, we do note that some of the uh, participants, um, they may not be like, you know, the gentleman earlier, he said that he doesn't have computing background, but we do have, you know, we suggest hit start courses for you on your own, sign up for free Python classes. So on screen, I've shown two links for you to, um, you know, uh, subscribe. Oh, I think these are free courses for you to understand more about Python before you join our program. Now, this is a sample timetable. You could see that um, for example, week one, you have a class on Thursday night and at the same time on Saturday, you have a 3.30 p.m. class. You know, there could be uh, at other semesters, there could be a variation. Some, some lectures are able to make it on Saturday, so you might have two classes on Saturday. It depends. So in this sample that I've shown, week two, you have one module. Let's call it module C. That happens on Friday night. And then the cycle goes on again. So that's why we say the modules uh, happen every alternate week. But from your point of view, every week you need to have classes at SIM. Right, 
Let's talk about entry requirements. So there are two entry routes, route one and route two. Route one would be for students with a first degree in the relevant subject. And you could see the listing of relevant subjects on the screen. And then uh, minimally, you need to have second class honours. Now, what happens if you have a third class uh, honours degree? Not to worry, we have had candidates who were in the category where they didn't score a second upper, but they have lots of work experience. So they get accepted into the University of London uh, master's program, uh, provided they pass a Python course. So in the next slide, I'll show you the official Python course for you to take up before uh, you, you come into uh, the program. This is only meant for, for example, students that do not meet the entry route one requirements. Now we look at entry route two. Entry route two are for students with any, with a degree, but not in something that's um, uh, like computing, data science, you know. So it's something, it could be an arts degree, okay? It could be a mass comm degree. So you will come in through entry route two. For entry route two students, you have to take a Coursera program. So on this screen, you could see that um, the Coursera program is known as Foundations of Data Science. K means clustering in Python. So this is a must for students who, who come in via entry route two or students on conditional offer. Now this program uh, takes about 30 weeks or you take about six weeks to cover the program. You are expected to put in about nine hours per week and on completion um, we require you to um, to get the online certificate of completion and to get that it means you need to pay usd 49 so when you apply for the program with sim um, you should also give us the online certificate of completion okay now there um there are three points here on the contents so um the mathematical concepts, then there's implementation of k-means, and then data clustering. So that is this program is for those who are from entry route two or those who are on conditional offer. Now, if you are a Singaporean, that's good news. Skills Future Study Award um, is waiting for you to apply. The amount is five thousand. Okay, so you can go to IMDA uh, or Skills Future portal to find out more. Now, there are certain criteria. So that includes the fact that you need to be a Singapore citizen, you need to have at least three years of work experience, you know, and many others. So that's, that's the um, information I have for the Skills Future Study Award. I've come to the end of the session. I think we can still take some questions. Uh, let me check out what other questions are there. What Maybe about Shenghui? Yeah, yes. I'll, address, <clears throat> I'll address one of the questions that was posted by the audience just now. Uh, is RPA part of AI and have a association with some, of, uh, some with data science? Or is it completely outside the Venn diagram as shown earlier? So maybe... So, if I, so if I understand RPA is the robotic process automation. And um, in that case, if it is, if that's what you mean by RPA, it, yes, absolutely, it falls within AI. It's it's um, it's robotic processes that are that are using machine learning um, to be able to improve the processes and to be able to um, interact using different user interfaces. Um, and and there's a lot of learning going on there, so it's definitely it falls squarely within the artificial intelligence and bleeding into the computer science side of things because there's a lot of and the engineering electronics and robotics. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of overlap with all of these fields, but absolutely, yes. Uh, Shenghui, you have, uh, do you have more questions there? I'm trying to log into my uh, portal. Yes, we do have uh, another okay. question. So um, this person is concerned about COVID-19. The outbreak has led to the shrinking of the current job market. Then uh, the question is, will the program be considered to be offered on a one-time, a one-year full-time basis? to get um, the student ready for the job market recovery phase? Right, okay, thank you for the question. I would say for now, the plans are still to, to, to have it, um, not to you know, crash the course into a year, 
So it would still be for SIM, we'll still run uh, three modules per semester. So the masters likely will be completed over two years. Mm. Okay, uh, one last question that I have over here regarding the research topic. So will the student be given specific topic um, by the UOL or they have to think themselves of the research topic? And is the final project similar concept or different? Um, Jamie, would you know the answer? So this is, uh, this is outside the machine learning topic uh, or would it uh, the, 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 the master's program, at the end of the course, there is a project work. Whether right. it's, um, it's uh, specific, you know, the question is specific to all students or students get to choose their yeah. topics. That's a very good question. I don't have an immediate answer because I think that may, I'm not sure if that's been, I'm not sure exactly the answer to that. So we need to follow up on that. Apologies. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Shen Hui, hmm? if you could uh, help me take note of the um, the person who asked the question, we'll get back. And over here at my end, uh, we have I have quite a few questions here. Just let me see. Um, oh, I think it's the same question, right? Okay. Um, that's this. Okay. Uh, oh, it's the same question. Shall we? We have we share the same questions. Over here, I do see some questions on our portal. Um, okay. It's more general questions asking what program language is required for the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science program? Is it Java or Python? Uh, for BSc, I think it is Java. Mm, okay, then um, there's another question being posted. Uh, could you show the links again for the free Python class? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, for even undergrads or master students, you know, no worries. Just, just uh, I'll, I'll show you the slide uh, where I have the links. You can take a photo. Okay, I'll keep this slide on. Um, oh, I would like to show the other slide as well, just in case uh, the student is asking about this program. So, so the other one is the free one where we encourage everyone to go online, pick up Python. But for Masters of Science students, if you need to take a certification, uh, this is the one. You go into Coursera or on Google, you can key in Foundations of Data Science. K means clustering in Python. You'll get to this. Um, Coursera course and you can sign up over there. Okay, right. Any other questions from the floor? Okay, not at Shenhui's side, not at my side. Okay, uh, right. So I think that's all for today. And really thank you everyone and Dr. Jamie you know, for spending your morning, it's morning over, Saturday morning over in London. Thank you for taking time, you know, to be with us. And I hope everyone enjoyed the masterclass. Um, and then thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. If you have further questions, okay, you could email us or call us. And uh, thank you everyone. And uh, have a good weekend.